Hi there, folks, and welcome to another edition of Israel Explained with Shayel Ben Ephraim. Today, we're going to be talking about a part of the war that seems pretty peripheral to Israel, but is getting very real and very important to the United States and other countries in the world. We're going to talk about the Houthi rebels. Houthi rebels have been trying to be a factor in the war in Gaza for a while. Uh, they first did so by releasing an amazing music video, which shows them dancing in traditional Yemenite style, with surprisingly high production values, so good for that. They also have been firing missiles at Israel, but those missiles have generally been missing or landing in empty areas, certainly not causing any damage and leading to a lot of punchlines in Israeli comedy shows. So that hasn't worked that well. But now, as I'm sure you all know, they become more relevant by stopping or damaging shipping going through the Horn of Africa. We'll talk about why that's important and what's going to happen um, with that. But first, a little bit about who the Houthis are. The Houthis are now a terror group made up of Zaidi Muslims. Zaidi Muslims are 35% of the population of Yemen, so an important minority in the country. What makes you a Zaidi? If you still mourn Zaid ibn Ali's unsuccessful rebellion in 740 against the Umad Caliphate. So I'm sorry if you're still uh, in mourning about that nowadays. They used to be a largely peaceful group, but in 2014 they started moving over to terrorism. The story of how that happened is familiar to those who know Hezbollah and Lebanese politics. Iran had a big hand in taking local grievances encouraging members of a group that felt that it had been um, oppressed to take up arms. Those arms were provided by Iran, and soon Iran had a sort of proxy organization at its fingertips. Experts don't agree on how much of a proxy the Houthis are, which is a common thing whenever you have analysts of one of these groups. I'm no expert on the Houthis, uh, but I will say that usually the truth is somewhere between the um, idea that proxy groups do everything that they're told by their, you know, quote unquote masters and between having a lot of independence. Usually if you're a proxy group and you're, de you're dependent militarily and geopolitically on a patron, you will do what they tell you to do uh, unless you have a very good reason not to. Even Israel does that with the United States. Um, so when the Houthis are doing something, you can bet that either the Iranians want them to do it, or the Iranians at least did not veto them from doing it. Now, the move that the Houthis have done recently is try to block trade traffic through the Horn of Africa. And that is very likely, at least uh, something that Iran approves of, more likely something that Iran initiated, because it has strong geopolitical ramifications. And Iran is a geopolitical player, the Houthis not so much. Um, so a few weeks ago, the Houthis gave the following announcement. They said, quote, if Gaza does not receive the food and medicine it needs, all ships in the Red Sea bound for Israeli ports, regardless of their nationality, will become a target for our armed forces. Now, of course, we know that Israel and the United States have let in a good deal of humanitarian aid, but apparently not enough for the highly humanitarian conscious Houthis. So they've been attacking ships. Uh, we've seen three ships that we know of come under attack in international waters in the last week. There's probably more that we don't know of. Four major shipping companies have announced they're suspending operations in the region and sending their goods around the Cape uh, instead. That has very significant economic ramifications. Why? Well, even though we have planes and 3D printers and all sorts of alternative technology to transfer goods, 80% of the world's trade is still conducted by sea. It's more economically efficient. And so anything that's not very urgent will go by sea. Out of that 80%, about a quarter goes through the Horn of Africa. And it's easy to see why. If you want to trade from um, Asia to Europe, you will want to use the Suez Canal. And there's no way to get through the Suez Canal without going through the Horn of Africa. And the Horn of Africa has been a site for pirate um, takeovers of ships, 
Uh, we know Tom Hanks was the victim of that on many occasions because so much of the world's shipping goes through it. It's a very narrow strait and failed states border it, especially Somalia. But now we're seeing another failed state that is causing trouble, and that is Yemen. Um, so we have four major shipping companies that suspended operations there. Like I said, the war risk premiums have risen from 0.07% of the value of the ship to 0.2%. And that is almost times three. So that bites into profit margins. And what does that mean? That means that consumers pay more for everything that is shipped. And in particular, oil. So that also adds to inflation and it destabilizes the global economy. Now, if you know anything about international relations theory or reality, the most powerful country in the world is usually responsible for guaranteeing the shipping lanes because they profit most from trade and stability of the international system. The United States, having taken some significant hits in the international system, is still considered the hegemonic power, has by far the biggest navy in the world, and has traditionally taken the responsibility of keeping ship lanes open, including in operations uh, against piracy in the Horn of Africa, which again brings us to Tom Hanks, who was rescued by American forces in the movie, at least as far as I remember. I don't know, I saw it ages ago. Uh, so the U.S. is going to react to this provocation. It's just a question of how and when we'll respond to the uh, provocation. Uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is currently in Israel, and he plans to go to several nations in the region. His goal is to create an international coalition that will open the shipping lanes. Uh, will that work? Not necessarily. In 1967, uh, Lyndon Johnson tried to create a similar coalition to open the Straits of Tehran when Egypt had closed it to international shipping in order to pressure Israel. He tried to get Canada, the Netherlands, and other friendly countries to join. The coalition ended up falling apart because uh, a lot of countries didn't want to take the too firm a side, end up having their ships shot at, end up being boycotted by Arab states. So it didn't work at the time, and it may not work now. However, there are already ships in the area. It's just that the United States is hesitant to use them aggressively without the support of a coalition. There's British, French, even a Japanese ship in a flotilla in the area that has already committed to keeping the shipping lanes open. So what, what is the United States waiting for? It's waiting for Middle Eastern partners. Uh, it wants the UAE to join, and the UAE, there's a high likelihood that they will join, from what I'm hearing from various sources. And they also want Egypt to join, and it's unclear Egypt will join, even though Egypt has a big navy in the area, and Egypt benefits the most from trade in um, Suez Canal. They may hope that others will keep it open for them. So... Um, the United States has the capacity to act now. It's just waiting until it gets more support. When it's clear what that support will be, then it's probably going to use its military force at that point. Of course, what the Houthis are doing through Iran is nothing new in the Arab-Israeli conflict. The use of financial leverage by countries fighting against Israel is a tradition. We already talked about the Straits of Tehran which the uh, Egyptians closed in 56 and in 67, both leading to wars. There was an Arab boycott on Israel, which in some countries still continues to this day. And most dramatically for the United States, in 1973, the OPEC nations started a boycott on countries supporting Israel and also lowered production, causing a bona fide economic crisis in the United States and in Western Europe that changed the geopolitical balance in the region and opinions towards the Arab-Israeli conflict deeply. So this is a, a, an important issue with real implications. However, I should note that Iran and the Houthis don't have the same pull economically, geopolitically, and militarily as all the Arab states had as a collective in 1973. So 
I don't think it'll be that dramatic, but that's why the United States is so worried and trying to form um, a coalition. Now, it will likely take several weeks and possibly even a, even uh, two months or three months to put together this coalition. But just the announcement that the coalition exists might be enough for the U.S. Navy to go after the Houthis. It doesn't really need um, the rest of the coalition on a military level. It needs the rest of the coalition just on a diplomatic level. Although the Egyptian Navy would certainly help on a military um, on a military level as well. So the U.S. has two options here, and I'm not sure which one they'll take. And it probably depends on how ferociously the Houthis keep going after ships. One is to reactively accompany ships going through the Horn of Africa. Um, that would involve defensively trying to protect the, the ships going through without seeking out Houthi targets. Uh, the other would be to proactively attack Houthi bases using Tomahawk missiles and possibly even carrier jets. Uh, this might be where the UAE comes in because the UAE has a pretty good air force now based on American planes and the Houthi bases are well within range of the UAE. So that may be part of what the talks are. You may notice that one country is not being mentioned in this coalition against the Houthis. And that country is a country that has a long standing beef with the Houthis, and that's Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has a big role in creating the Houthis through opposition to their policies, through opposition to their intervention in, uh, in Yemen. And they've been at war with the Houthis basically since they've existed. So the Houthi rebels come into existence as a military force in 2014. Saudi Arabia has been at war with them since 2015. But Saudi Arabia is currently involved in a policy that is trying to remove them from regional conflicts. I think that's the best way to understand what Saudi Arabia is doing, right? They have that peace initiative with Israel that everyone was talking about, currently on ice, not necessarily dead. But they also had rapprochement going with Iran. They Iran and Saudi Arabia mutually recognized each other after years of not doing that and not having diplomatic representation in the other country. And since September, they've had ongoing talks with the Houthis leading to a ceasefire, the Saudis hope leading to peace. All this because the Saudis are trying to pivot to a more modern economy so that they can move away from oil and become a goods and services economy in the long run. They're trying to attract tourism. They're trying to attract investment. They don't want war. So they're not going to be involved in any of these um, coalitions against the Houthis. It's very important to them that uh, they manage to get peace with the Houthis. Whether that will last or not is a very good question. Iranian proxies, not too reliable in, uh, in negotiations. So in conclusion about the Houthis, um, this has dramatic geopolitical ramifications, especially if the Houthis manage to slow down or completely stop trade through the Horn of Africa. The current losses of shipping through there are already significantly affecting the global economy, so the U.S. will be forced to act. And that already means that the U.S. is part of this war and operationally part of this war, even though indirectly. So this will have dramatic effects also on the role of the United States in the war, and we'll be watching that closely. Watch this space. And now, let's answer some of your questions. Um, Jario or Jario, I don't know, super asks, would you mind covering what the current state of public opinion is actually like on the Israel-Gaza conflict? Social media is obviously skewed and I haven't seen any accurate large-scale opinion polls within Western countries to see if support for Israel has significantly changed. Okay, this is a very large topic, so I'll only touch it very briefly. Um, regarding the United States, the polls show a pretty clear picture. Support for Israel overall is strong and steady, no matter what poll you look at. The one exception, as we all know, is the under-24 group, which I've seen some pretty different pictures of. According to some polls, it's divided, 
or even slightly leaning towards support of Israel. According to others, it's violently anti-Israel and doesn't want Israel uh, to exist. And we'll get into that. Um, but overall, support for Israel is strong. A recent Wall Street Journal poll found 42% in all age groups support Israel and only 12 support the Palestinians. Gaps between Republicans and Democrats on this are massive, but among Democrats, it's more or less split. And among Republicans, it's massively pro-Israel. So the overall tends to be pro-Israel. Um, Biden's response in that poll got a 37% approval. But there's, the reason for that is because some people think that Biden's doing too much, and some people think that Biden's doing too little. So his criticism isn't coming from one side. He's finding a kind of happy medium in a sense, but like everything else with Biden, it's unpopular. His happy medium is not popular in an increasingly polarized society. Um, then there's another interesting poll. I just saw the Harvard-Harris one. That one gives Israel even more support. They say 81% of Americans back Israel overall. But what was even more interesting was their analysis of the 18 to 24s. And I think the analysis in the Harvard-Harris poll really shows you why the polls are so different regarding that age group. And you see so, so many different um, uh, interpretations of this and numbers. It's because people between 18 and 24 are very confused. I think we already know that, but the poll shows this. They don't really understand the facts. So you tell them different things, and they will often agree because it sounds logical. So here's an example. 51% of 18 to 24 think Israel should be ended and handed over to the Palestinians. And that got a lot of headlines. But what got less headlines in the same poll is that 58% of them think that Hamas should be removed and most considered them terrorists who have performed genocide, over 60%. But over 60% also think Israel is performing genocide. So basically, young people don't seem to like either side. They think they're both performing genocide. Um, the majority still believe in a two-state solution, including a lot of people who said that Israel should be ended. So they're talking about two completely different solutions. Basically, whatever you say to them, they're agreeing to varying degrees. So they're confused, and it shows. They're not um, uniformly anti-Israel in a coherent way. They're anti-Israel in an incoherent way. As for other countries, um, there has been increased support for Israel in a lot of Western European countries. Uh, my guess is because of the violent pro-Hamas jihadi demonstrations. Um, so what we're seeing in a lot of these places is more bitter hatred towards Israel among the people who are inclined to dislike it, and more support among people who are tending to support Israel, and more support among neutrals who um, are increasingly seeing not so much that Israel is doing great things, because most people think that Israel is killing civilians um, indiscriminately, which it's not, but uh, a lot more of a sense that Hamas are terrorists and their supporters are terrorists. So there's a lot of different things going on. Israel is not losing the PR war in the way that people think that it is. It's actually holding its own quite well. But, you know, social media will social media. Okay, Pratchett Guyman. And by the way, I love that name. Great writers. Do you think that the hostage deals will also include releasing Avera Menjitsu and Hisham Al-Sayed, uh, who were taken in, I'm adding, 20, in 2015 and 2014, respectively? Uh, unfortunately, the answer to that is no. Uh, Hamas may surprise Israel, and if they do, uh, that will win them some brownie points with Israel or Qatar or the United States or everyone involved. So they do have some interest in doing that. They've both been on Israel's radar for a long time. Um, Avera was taken in a military operation. Um, Hisham uh, wandered over into, into Gaza. Um, Hisham may well uh, be dead. I've heard that his um, health condition has deteriorated greatly in 2015. Sorry, in 2022. So we don't really know that he's alive. Uh, Avera, there's a better chance that he's alive. We don't have any real evidence that his health is deteriorating or anything like that. But I don't think that he'll be released. Hamas hasn't been offering them, and Israel has been asking about them. So that would be a great surprise. Uh, it's not impossible, and I'll tell you why. 
Hamas is currently scrambling to get enough people for a future hostage deal if they find that one would be in their interests. As we said, they've executed a lot of hostages. Other hostages have died. And they've also lost track of some hostages. So if they can get someone else to make up the numbers or to get some brownie points, they may do it. Still, I think it's unlikely. I think that if Hamas had been able to um, to release them, they are willing to release them, they, they would have. They may have lost track or they're dead, unfortunately. CD asks, we have no idea what is the extent of territorial control in Gaza of the IDF advances. So what's happening in Khan Yunus? Well, I was just looking at some reports from, from Khan Yunus. And what's happening in Khan Yunus is this. Israel is expanding the front there greatly. So it started off in uh, northern Khan Yunus. Now it's moving into southern Khan Yunus. It started off in the eastern side as well. So it's coming from the northeast. And now it's moving into the west. So what's happening right now is the IDF is spreading out throughout the entire city. Um, I think that they're thinking of the long-term operations because Israel was given warning that it can't go on taking territory forever. It only has a few weeks to do that, but it can purify territory, to use the Israeli military term, letahel, to purify, of terrorists in the longer term. So I think it's spreading out its control in Khan Yunus over a wide area geographically, and then it will be able to take its time cleaning the areas out. So I think all of Khan Yunus, I'm just guessing, will be under light Israeli control. When I say light Israeli control, I mean Israel will have soldiers everywhere, but they'll still be terrorists within a week or so, maybe 10 days. Then it will be able to take its time uh, there. But it may only superficially control it before moving on elsewhere to other areas that are strongholds. It has to be said, there are no other Hamas strongholds at the level of Khan Yunus and Gaza City. That has to be repeated. Um, there's nothing like that anywhere else. There's a lot of other areas where they where they are. So Khan Yunus is, um, there's a lot going on there. Jabalia, I'm told by the IDF, has completely surrendered. The Jabalia battalion is gone. And Sujawiya is uh, almost completely destroyed, not only in the sense of its battalion is almost completely destroyed, but the neighborhood is almost completely destroyed. Israel is basically raising that neighborhood to the ground. So that's what's happening now. Those are the three focuses. Finally, Fred says, close friend to the show, Fred, I have a comment and a question. This is referring to the video I posted yesterday. I don't think the breakdown between the hostage firsters and the beat Hamas firsters is as clean as the pro and anti-judicial reform protests from the spring. Yes, the hostages were primarily from the South, which was very involved in the anti-reform pro-democracy movement. However, I think the breakdown is more along the lines of hostage families and their supporters on the one hand, the families of the 10-7 deceased and those serving in the IDF on the other. The latter probably feel like Israel is valuing the lives of the hostages more than those of the soldiers and other citizens affected by this war. The question, do you think the hostage families are making a strategic mistake by going after Netanyahu personally? As shown by the protests from this spring, Netanyahu seems impervious to criticism and personal attacks. He actually doubled down on judicial reform as the protests got louder and involved more civil disobedience. Okay, so um, there's a lot to unpack here. First, you said the people from the South are primarily, were primarily involved in the anti-reform pro-democracy movement. And that's not true. You have the kibbutzim down there, and they're more anti-Netanyahu, but then you also have the Ayarot Pituach, the development towns, and they're more pro-Netanyahu. So it's more complicated. And like you said, it doesn't break down into hostage firsters and beat Hamas firsters. There's people on both sides who are from, you know, the other camp. Take me, for example. I would consider myself a Hamas firster. Uh, I think destroying Hamas is the most important thing right now because um, the hostages, if we always focus on the hostages, then that'll encourage the taking of more hostages in the future. And I think that not beating Hamas would be an existential danger to Israel. However, I'm anti-judicial reform. So I totally prove your point. However, because the critical mass and especially the leadership of each movement comes from different political camps, it creeps in. And then there's this push and pull between being too identified with those political movements that have, to some extent, been discredited during this war. People don't really want to hear about that right now and, uh, and staying out of that. 
And that feeds into your question. You said, is this a mistake going personally after Netanyahu? The answer to that is yes. I think that if the hostages' families make this too personal, make this too partisan, make this too political, they're actually going to encourage Netanyahu to do less to help them. And they're going to lower sympathy among people on the right and even people on the right center uh, and also people who are like myself who are supporting the war effort and don't really support Netanyahu. So I think they're not doing themselves any favors. Um, I think that they should say that the government of Israel is responsible for their families, but anyone who is attacking Netanyahu personally too much, and especially linking it to other issues like the judicial reform, for those reasons, I think is making a mistake. Of course, I completely support the hostages' families. I hope they get released. And uh, they have an absolute right to get involved in the political process. It's just a question of what the best strategy is for them. Okay, so we'll leave it here uh, uh, for now. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. Tell your friends all about it. And I will be here again tomorrow with another episode of Israel Explained.